Hey guys, welcome into the weekend news wrap up. That's right, I'm still alive. I'm still making content. We've had uni holidays, we've had Easter holidays, we've had family holidays, and outside of all of that, I'm still here making the best news in the business. We've got the light and the dark. Summertime is here. Let's get into it. First thing we need to discuss, it's been a while since I've talked, it's been so long in fact that the last big issue that I haven't been able to talk about was the Trump administration's cruise missile attack against Syria. If you'll remember back, there were reports that the Assad regime was using chemical weapons against the people in Syria. As a response, the Trump administration said, okay, we're going to launch 59, I believe, cruise missiles into a specific air base where the Trump administration alleged that the Syrian regime had chemical weapons and the base that it launched its chemical weapons or its aircraft that were carrying the chemical weapons from. What's the takeaway here? Well, the first thing to notice is it's probably the first and one of the only things that the Trump administration has done that has garnered bipartisan support from everyone across Republican and Democratic aisles. Also, internationally, it was a big popular international move that said, you know, there's an international norm that says we don't want people to use chemical warfare, chemical weapons in warfare. And so, by and large, people were applauding the move. But it is interesting because the first thing we have to remember is it's a very limited response, which I think personally as a realist is good. We don't want to precipitate more American involvement necessarily. Maybe you think there should be. You can look back on previous episodes and get my opinion about how I don't think there should be much more American involvement. So it's a very limited, very measured response, which I think you can, you can attribute to General H.R. McMaster and General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisor, advising Trump on these types of issues. So by and large, it's a good thing. But will it really change anything? Not really. It's not going to change anything because remember, Russia, Assad, in Syria and Iran are the ones who have troops in Syria because they have troops and manpower in Syria. They will dictate what happens. And it's just an interesting thing to note that the international community seems to be completely okay or at least okay enough to not launch cruise missile attacks when Assad uses conventional weapons like barrel bombs to obliterate his own people. But when we use chemical weapons, oh, it's wrong. That's a red line you can't cross. So that's another interesting distinction that needs to be made. But again, I'm for a measured response, but no more because I think if the U.S. tried to invade Syria, Oh my goodness, we've learned in Afghanistan, we've learned in Iraq, we've learned in Libya. Probably not the best thing to do. Moving on, what are some other things? Two other things I want to hit on. First of all, it's been reported over the last day that the Taliban have attacked an Afghanistan base. Now this is very disconcerting because the Taliban were disguised as a member of the Afghan security forces and they were able to infiltrate a base, gain access to the grounds of the base. Suicide bomber blew himself up at the last checkpoint. The rest of the Taliban members, again dressed as Afghan soldiers, drove into the base and basically um, went, used guns to attack soldiers who were praying and who were eating. Now, ask yourself this. If you were a member of the Afghanistan army, you would probably feel very disconcerted. Your morale would be very low if the Taliban is not just killing you on the battlefield, right? It's one thing to be killed on the battlefield. It's another thing to be resting on your base and have people who are dressed up like you infiltrate your base and kill you while you are praying and eating. That's a whole other level of existential crisis. And what many people in the Afghan security services are saying is the Taliban must have had help from the inside. They must have had infiltrators on the inside of the security apparatus of the Afghan military force. Morale would then make you be very low. If you were a, a young man in Afghanistan, you probably wouldn't necessarily feel a lot of internal and external encouragement to go join the armed forces when there is this perception out there that it's already been infiltrated by the Taliban, or even in general, that they can't even protect their own soldiers while they're on base does not bode well for what the U.S. is trying to do in building up a massive security force in Afghanistan. Very, very dangerous, very low morale. And again, it's not the first time that the Taliban have disguised themselves as members of the Afghan security force and launched an attack against an Afghan security force installation. All right, last thing to cover today, guys, North Korea. In case you have been wondering, in case you've been out of the loop, the crisis around the North Korean peninsula is escalating to levels we haven't seen in probably a decade or two. Very tense right now. The U.S. 
is putting the pressure on the Kim regime to denuclearize, to get rid of its nuclear weapons, and presumably to stop its intercontinental ballistic missile development. What's the best way that the U.S. wants to go about forcing the North Koreans to denuclearize? They're putting pressure on China because China is by far and away the reason why the Kim Jong-un regime is surviving and the reason why Kim, the Kim regime can actually continue to develop nuclear weapons, intercontinental ballistic te technology. And so I've made a video about this recently. I encourage you to look this up if you're interested on the North Korean issue. But for many, many years, America and the broader international community, their biggest worry or complaint is that China has not done enough, has not used the leverage that it holds against Korea. If China wanted to denuclearize Korea, China could do it tomorrow by cutting off all of the aid, all of the food, all of the coal, all of the different things that it sends in to North Korea. Why doesn't China want to do this? Because China fears that if it cuts off aid in its relationship with North Korea, the Kim regime will implode. What happens when regimes implode and there's regime instability? Well, we've learned this in Syria, a massive, massive refugee problem. Where are all those refugees going to go? They're going to go into China. The last thing that China wants is two or three million North Koreans flooding across its borders, right? We've already seen that Europeans aren't necessarily wanting or encouraging to get a bunch of refugees into their system. Obviously, China doesn't want the same. They face enough domestic problems as it is. All right, guys, that's what we have to look forward to. That's what I wanted to highlight. I'm coming back to you with more movies. But until then, ladies and gentlemen, remember, reality always trumps ideology. Mm -hmm.